Yeah. Yes, exactly. We have a lot of commentary about how it's been handled uh, poorly <laughs> or well in certain places, and you've heard my hot takes off air about how Georgia has handled it, but we'll leave that for another day yeah. um, in any case. Well, what I was... <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of a tickle. Um, what I was going to say is uh, Governor Cuomo making the point that states are going to need help. And states like New York, where they have everything shut down, in particular New York City, which contributes a lot to the tax base overall of the state, yeah. they are hurting. And they were talking about the next phase of assistance really needs to be the states. The states got some in phase three, but you, know, you are going to see a state like New York, they're going to need some financial help and they you know they have to have balanced budgets they can't just spend without having some way to pay it back and we're going to have to think about when it comes to assistance what we need to do and it's going to be disproportionate because some states are going to be hit much harder than others or some cities as we already know are going to be hit much more than others and you need to remember we talked about this over the last week, a state like California, a state like New York, I mean, they contribute, a state like Texas, you know, depending on how hard they hit, they contribute a lot to the overall U.S. economy. And this is important. It's not just what the economic activity in the state, but what they contribute to other states around. So this is something we'll listen to uh, in the uh, coming days. Well, and speaking of the economy, uh, one of the best pieces I've read of late uh, about this, especially as it relates to the blue collar economy, was written by Sean Don, and he is senior trade reporter. So so much more, I feel like, for Bloomberg. Not that that's not an important job in its own right, but he really covers the spectrum. He's great to follow on Twitter at S. Don, and he joins us on the phone from the nation's capital. Sean, I uh, haven't talked to you in a while. How are you doing? You well? I'm good. I'm good. I've been hanging out at home. You? Yeah. Cuts both ways, right? <laughs> <laughs> Spending a lot of time with the kids. They're charming. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, you've done some incredible reporting, as always. Tell us about what you found, because you and some <laughs> colleagues sort of went out uh, virtually, I, I think, uh, into parts of America that maybe we're not as focused on here being especially hypersensitive about what's happening here in New York City. What would you find? Yeah, so we've been trying to track really hard where this downturn in the economy is, is hitting. We all know that the U.S. economy has hit a hard stop. Uh, we all know about those restaurants in New York that have shut down, the people of it, the hotels that have been hit, and so on. But one of the things that we've seen in the last couple of weeks as well is a big hit to industrial America. Uh, those factories in areas of the country, in some cases, that haven't been hit at all by the coronavirus or have seen one case in the county, as we found in Morris County, Texas, where uh, we went virtually by phone uh, to talk to uh, the folks and folks who had been laid off or about to be laid off at a steel mill there. Uh, but they're getting hit incredibly hard by the, uh, uh, by the economic slowdown. And, uh, and that's what you're seeing around the country. Perhaps, uh, I mean, one way of thinking about this is, is a lot of people out there are feeling the economic impact of this much more than they are actually the health impact. Of well, it's just a reminder, Jason, this just begs to what we were talking about, the connectivity between the states. All right, you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser, along with Jason Kelly. We do want to take you to Massachusetts, where the governor there, Charlie Baker, is giving an update, just getting ready to, on the virus. Unprecedented ways over the past few weeks. At the same time, the organizations that employ these folks have had their operating models totally disrupted by both COVID-19 and also many of the decisions and the orders that we've issued uh, to make sure that we are properly prepared for the surge. The result for many of our healthcare provider organizations has been a huge hit to their operations and to their cash flow. To make sure these organizations can continue to operate and continue to meet the astronomical demands that we are placing on them, we plan to invest $800 million into the Commonwealth's health care providers. This funding will support hospitals, nursing facilities, primary care providers, behavioral health providers, and long-term service providers and supports for other providers impacted by COVID-19 and the health emergency and many of the declarations, orders, and decisions that we've made and issued. More than $400 million will be allocated to hospitals, 
More than 80 million will go to nursing facilities, and more than 300 million will be allocated to other health care providers that are delivering medical care or providing services that keep residents safe in their homes and out of the hospitals. It will be distributed starting this month, April, through July. We are able to pull this critical funding together largely through offsets, by reductions in mass health, and enhanced federal revenue. And we want to thank our colleagues in the legislature who we engaged in a discussion with this prior to making this announcement and going forward with this proposal. The funding comes in addition to the $290 million in immediate cash relief and $550 million in accelerated payments to providers that we announced earlier in March. As we continue to navigate these unprecedented times, our administration will keep doing whatever we can to support the health care workers who are keeping us all safe. With respect to testing, as you know, we've been working aggressively to expand capacity here in the Commonwealth and are continuing to ramp up our efforts. Massachusetts is now one of the largest and most expansive testers in the country, and testing is going to be a huge part of how we develop strategies to deal with this virus going forward. We're incredibly grateful to the public and private labs and healthcare partners that have allowed us to dramatically increase our testing capacity and our output. In addition to the state lab, there are now 25 public and private labs testing in Massachusetts. As of yesterday, 76,429 patients have been tested, with nearly 4,500 new tests reported in the previous 24 hours. We're making a lot of progress, but we also know there's much more to do. This weekend, Lieutenant Governor Polito and I visited a new drive through testing facility for first responders at Patriots Place in Foxborough. As we continue to talk to our partners at the local level across the state, we're going to continue to add more of these in all parts of Massachusetts. And earlier today, in partnership with CVS, we announced a new rapid testing site in Lowell, which will enable on-the-spot testing and results at no cost. The new CVS site in Lowell will use the new Abbott ID Now test and anticipates being able to test 1,000 people per day and receive the results on site within minutes. People will be able to know if they're positive for coronavirus and take action immediately to seek the proper treatment. Positive cases will be connected to our contact tracing program who will be on site, which we announced last Friday. And multiple language assistance will also be made available. These tests are available for all residents who qualify based on the CVS website's questionnaire. And more information is available at CVS.com. The new test site is well stocked with personal protective equipment, and we're hopeful to have enough supplies right now to get them through at least the next two weeks of testing. And we're grateful to the folks over at CVS for getting this up and running and supporting our efforts to expand testing capacity. As we work to isolate positive cases and prevent further spread, we know there's no population at greater risk than seniors, especially the ones who live in congregate care and long-term care facilities. There are roughly a thousand such facilities in the Commonwealth, so this is a hugely important part of the, our response to the pandemic. Through the command center, the Commonwealth has taken several steps to support congregate care and long-term care facilities. The COVID-19 command center has been doing several things to help these facilities prepare as best they can before infection started spreading and doing everything we can now to help these facilities deal with outbreaks. Should an outbreak occur, the Department of Public Health assigns an epidemiologist and nurses to support the staff who are working directly with the residents at each facility. Today, the Department of Public Health has issued enhanced guidelines to protect the health of residents and health care workers and to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 spread both inside and outside of these facilities. We've also significantly expanded our ability to rapid test at each of these facilities. One of the most important things we can do is test this population quickly to identify positive cases and take appropriate action such as isolation or treatment. Over the past several days, Massachusetts has launched a robust testing program for our seniors to do on-site tests at our nursing homes. It's not only a faster way to test, but it also prevents seniors who may be fragile or ill for other reasons from being disrupted 
or having to be brought to a hospital or an outside healthcare facility. The testing is being conducted by trained personnel from the Mass National Guard in partnership with DPH and the Broad Institute. These samples are then prioritized for processing. So far, the National Guard has been deployed to 80 facilities across the state and has completed more than 1,350 tests since this program started seven days ago. Today, they will visit an additional 20 facilities. And we'll continue to build testing capacity in the coming weeks to serve a greater population and support many of our most vulnerable residents. Secretary Sutter has a lot more to say about this in a second. I want to remind people today, tomorrow, the day after, to stay home and to continue to take the necessary precautions associated with social distancing and following the guidelines that have been issued to keep each other and especially our most vulnerable members of our community safe and healthy at this time. We're extremely grateful for everything everyone has done to help us mitigate the spread of this virus in what has been, we would all agree, an incredibly difficult and trying time. The coming weeks will be crucial in fighting this disease and especially dealing with the surge, and we want to thank you for all you're doing to help us and to help your friends and your neighbors and your families. Residents can continue to stay informed by visiting mass.gov slash COVID-19, which has been newly redesigned based on feedback from the public to help users find more quickly the information that they're looking for and that they need. And I do want to say thanks to the folks at the Executive Office of Technology and Security Services for their work with the Department of Public Health and our office to launch this redesigned site. It's part of our commitment to make sure. And you've been listening to Governor Charlie Baker of Massachusetts giving an update on that state's response, reiterating, Carol, uh, we are in the midst of stay at home, keep doing it. That is the message that we're hearing from a lot of governors, especially here across a lot of these hotspots. We heard it from uh, Governor. Governor Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo earlier, and uh, I think we're going to continue to hear it from the nation's leading governors. Right, and do more testing, and that has certainly yes, been testing, very, very, exactly. very helpful. All right, uh, kind enough, uh, or he's been kind enough to stick around, Sean Donnan, who watches all things trade and globalization at Bloomberg News. We were talking about the manufacturing sector, those states, Sean, that maybe aren't being hardest hit by the virus itself firsthand, but they're certainly feeling a trickle-down effect as other states retrench. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's there's two parallel crises, and they're they're uh, linked, obviously, uh, going on right now. There is the the public health crisis that is very much front of mind uh, for all state governments and everywhere in the country. But in a lot of uh, parts of the country, the the real crisis that people are feeling is is the, the stop in the economy, and that is hitting the blue collar sector as well as the services sector. And so uh, you have been very prolific <laughs> writing a, a really number have. of other things. Uh, <laughs> Sean Donnan, uh, what else are you seeing out there? What what about trade in, in all of this? Yeah, so, I mean, all of this, you know, the reason I'm interested in the manufacturing economy is because I've been tracking it since the, the trade wars that we saw last year. Uh, and where one of the things, one of the side effects of the trade wars was a slowdown in the U.S. manufacturing sector. We actually had a manufacturing recession in the United States, although a lot of people don't realize it, uh, last year. And so that manufacturing sector was pretty weak coming into uh, into this year and, and the stop in the economy that we've seen now. Now we're also seeing the manufacturing sector get hit, not just by the slowdown here in the U.S. Uh, economy as a result of the stay-at-home orders and the, the slowing demand and just the fact people aren't moving and doing business anymore, but also because supply chains in China were getting hit a couple of months ago when factories were shut down there, which meant that they couldn't get the parts that they needed for for things that were being assembled here in the United States. Now they're, we're talking about, uh, I was talking to a manufacturer uh, last week who couldn't get a part out of Italy that he needs. Uh, we, you know, the world is in this uh, in this health crisis, and alongside it is this: the global economy is grinding to a halt, and that means uh, an, an effect that is just going to spread all around us, and, and that's going to keep going even after we get this uh, this health crisis under control. 
All right, Sean Donnan, thank you so much. We really appreciate you uh, splitting some time uh, with us between hearing uh, from the governor of Massachusetts as well. Sean Donnan, senior trade reporter, looking at the economic impact of this, which is so, so important, Carol. All right, quick check on the markets for you. And we've got equities. They are up, but they are definitely well off their highs of the session. Just about a seven-tenths of 1% gain on the S&P 500, up 18 points, up 189 points on the Dow. That's good for an eight-tenths of a percent gain. And call it just slightly higher on the NASDAQ, up two-tenths of a percent. That's a gain of about 15 points. We had quite a rally, up uh, more than 2%, but we have certainly seen some of that come undone. All right, let's talk about a a story that is in the magazine. Well, and it's not just a story. It's a book, Book. Carol. I can't. I'm so, I've been so excited for this book uh, to come out. Sarah Fryer wrote it. It's called No Filter. It's about Instagram. There's a fantastic excerpt uh, in the magazine this week. Can't get enough of it. Uh, Sarah joins us on the phone from San Francisco. First of all, congratulations. This is an amazing, amazing totally. accomplishment. How are you feeling? I feel good. I mean, it, this is what was crazy to me about this story is just how much of it hadn't been hadn't been uncovered and so I, I'm really excited to share the first excerpt today but also feel like there's there's so much that people will be able to learn about not just the tension between Instagram and Facebook but also Instagram's cultural impact on our world. So want to also bring in Joel Weber of course editor of Bloomberg Business Week he's on the phone from Brooklyn I mean this is such you know it's a great we know a great book already uh, and you've got an excerpt in the magazine but it is such a Business Week story as well we've been following Instagram and Facebook and kind of uh, I almost want to say the strife between the two Joel yeah I, I am so excited for Sarah um, I think this book is just going to be amazing and I uh, was really honored to be able to publish um, this particular excerpt because I think it really shows um, a side of Instagram and Facebook that you know we just no one's really seen it like this before and you know Instagram was this little darling app just barely um, a decade ago. And, you know, it just looks like this bargain that Mark Zuckerberg happened to pick up for, you know, pennies and now has turned it into a major cash cow that is part of this family of apps that he's built at Facebook. But in order to get there along the way, there was a lot of internal strife and tension. And that's ultimately what Sarah was able to bring to light in this particular part of her excerpt. And, um, Sarah, you know, like there's this pastry that makes an appearance uh, in this excerpt. Can I just ask you? What? Like, this is, yeah, what, what is, uh, what is the, the cruffin? Oh, it's, it's the San Francisco version of the rainbow bagel, basically. It's, it's a, it's a croissant muffin. <laughs> and it plays and it wait, what's at, it? at a, the launch event for Instagram TV. This this launch event was like the most Instagrammable thing possible. They had acai bowls and <laughs> matcha lattes, and um, at a sister event in New York, they had like champagne filled with, with cotton candy. Uh, really, it, it, I use that event as an example to show the contrast between. Instagram and Facebook. Instagram is really about um, presenting your life as this this beautiful manicured version, and Facebook is about this building your network and having friend connections. And the the philosophies of the two products really align with the founders and, and what kind of people they are. Zuckerberg being this dominant force trying to win over more and more of of humanity's attention and Instagram trying to create a place where, you know, culture can be appreciated and people can become, uh, become recognized for their own brands. And so, so eventually these two clash and when they're announcing IDTV in 2018, that was a moment for Sistrom realizing that Instagram wasn't really going to be allowed to thrive without without Zuckerberg's intense involvement in every step of the way, um, which is very different than the independence the company has projected in the past. And, and Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, you really tease out some 
sort of personality conflicts, too, that obviously had huge business implications, as you're alluding to, uh, Sarah. I would imagine there's much more uh, in the book uh, about this, because that was sort of the, the key point of tension that Carol alluded to uh, at the top of the conversation. Yeah, Zuckerberg is, is all about winning. Uh, he He's not about, you know, being careful and, and having, um, you know, a lot of attention to detail. And so and so we see that play out in their product strategy. I mean, Zuckerberg tried a million different things to counter the rise of Snapchat. Instagram tried one, and it worked. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, eventually when Instagram's growth actually accelerated after copying Snapchat stories, Zuckerberg saw a threat to Facebook. He saw that the Instagram way of doing things was gaining popularity, maybe at the expense of Facebook's longevity. And being the um, the dominating force that he is and really caring about his flagship product, he started talking about cannibalization, the idea that Instagram's success would eat into Facebook's potential and started driving the right. founders away. Right, and impact basically his baby, Facebook. Like, yeah. it's just, it's really phenomenal. Um, Sarah, congratulations. We're so excited for you. The book is No Filter, The Inside Story of Instagram. Uh, check out the book. Check out the excerpt that is uh, in the magazine this week. All right, for those of you listening in New York, D.C., San Francisco, watching on YouTube, Bloomberg Business Week continues right here. If you're listening on 1061 in Boston, Bay State Business, that is coming up next. Stick with us. We're going to get into the economic implications of the fight against the virus. This is Bloomberg. Because you can't watch Trolls World Tour at the cinema, Sky Store is bringing the cinema home to you with Sky Store Premiere. I'm going to destroy all music except for rock. We need to unite the trolls to save all music. Our brand new service that lets you watch movies at home that would normally be in the cinema. Rock and roll! Let's go save the world! Prepare for battle. This ought to be good. Enjoy Trolls World Tour now on Sky Store Premiere, bringing the cinema to you. Are we at war with COVID-19? The metaphor of choice is framing the way we confront the crisis, and not in a good way. This virus does not have intent. It can't be negotiated with. There will be no truce. Also, in this time of national unity, should celebrities just shut up? Don't miss this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app and see the latest editions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. April 7th, 2019, retiring NBA legends Dirk Nowitzki and Dwayne Wade play their final home games, both resulting in victories. And now, your greatest member, Dirk Certainly want to win it for Wade here at home in his final game in this building. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Behind the highlight reels, championship rings, and colossal paychecks, there are sports stories that fuel, deepen, and even challenge our love for the game. For true tales of underdogs, antiheroes, and game-changing innovators, search sports documentaries on the TuneIn app. Get your daily dose of NFL shop talk with these great podcasts on TuneIn. Start your morning off right with Around the NFL. Injured, depleted roster into the playoffs, and I didn't think they belonged in the playoffs. Mm. I think overall, though, it was, it was a great divisional round weekend because you got the first one. Run weekend. into the end zone with the Move the Sticks podcast. We had a fun little um, Zoom cocktail hour last night. Oh, yeah. What a star-studded affair. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, you were there for the earlier part, but it really popped off um, a little later on. We had Zach Goldman. And right. dive deep into the sidelines with the Peter King Podcast. On the occasion of his 50th birthday, come down and record a little bit of retrospective on the life and times of Brett Lorenzo Favre. That sounds like a bestseller. It's, no, it sounds like a precursor to a funeral. That's what it is. 
Uh, I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> Explore these and more hard-hitting NFL podcasts right here on TuneIn. <laughs> of the world 24 hours a day at bloomberg.com on the bloomberg business app and on quick take by bloomberg this is bloomberg radio from bloomberg world headquarters i'm charlie pallet we move into the final hour of trading on this tuesday we are now looking at a mixed market early gains are fading nasdaq is lower now down by a point we've got the s&p 500 index holding on to a 10 point gain up four tenths of one percent dow jones industrial average is up 119 points up now by five tenths of one percent have been up as much as 4.1 percent stay with bloomberg radio right through the closing bell to see how things shake out and of course how those asian markets react tonight bottom line those stocks are advancing for a second day s&p 500 index did venture briefly into bullish territory amid continuing optimism the spread of the coronavirus may be slowing in several major economies the 10-year down 20 30 seconds with a yield of 0.73 percent gold is down nine tenths of one percent lower by 14 dollars the ounce at 1646 west texas intermediate crude oil down 7.6 percent 24 a barrel. Steve Schwartzman, chief executive officer of Blackstone Group, says social distancing measures put in place to combat the spread of the coronavirus are unprecedented and creating massive disruptions in the business community. In a Bloomberg television interview this morning, Schwartzman said, quote, we have a GDP of somewhere around $21 trillion and we're probably going to miss $5 trillion of it. This is massive uh, and it washes throughout society, whether it's governments that uh, will lose tax revenue, uh, the inability to pay people uh, and provide services. Uh, and this is happening uh, almost in a mandated way. Uh, fortunately, it's going to be temporary. ExxonMobil is targeting its premier shale assets for deep cuts as it slashes worldwide spending to a four-year low and delays major projects to adapt amid the worst oil price, uh, oil price route in decades. ExxonMobil shares, they're up today holding on to a gain of 3.6%. Among some of the other oil majors, Chevron is up now by 2.3%. Gold down 9 tenths of 1%, recapping equities higher, S&P up 18% up seven-tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. We are awaiting some comments from the president uh, at the White House, an update on some of the efforts around rescuing small businesses. In the meantime, let's get to our White House correspondent. That's Josh Wingrove. He joins us on the phone. A couple great stories that you had a hand in, Josh. One of them is about the improvisation around this response from a federal level. Of course, those of us who've been following this know the sort of ebbs and flows, shall we say, rhetorically that the president has taken here. Help us understand what you found in this reporting. Yeah, first, way more ebbs and then many, many flows <laughs> come afterwards, I think, on that. Yeah, we. I mean, this, this was a case of Trump uh, sort of holding out hope that the virus would not be as bad as they thought. And by the time that uh, they decided to really take it more seriously, they've been sort of caught on their back foot uh, throughout it. And that's why we've seen governors, including Republican governors, uh, you know, speaking publicly about the need for more supplies, concerns about widespread testing shortages. And Trump uh, sort of in his go-to approach on these things is to uh, blame uh, his predecessor, for instance, like saying that they inherited a bare cupboard of testing. Well, of course, he's been you know, president for over three years, and the virus wasn't, you know, uh, around uh, under the previous administration, so that doesn't really uh, hold a lot of water. And his sort of go-to playbook is to directly intervene, and that can lead to some real whiplash-type scenarios. We saw that with GM. We've seen that with 3M as well. And so, you know, it's a bit of a mixed bag here, but at the end of the day, you know, so far we have 11,000 Americans who have died on this. The president has given himself... Uh, you know, full marks, proverbially, in his response. But, uh, it, you know, there, there are sort of real questions that it had the federal government or uh, another agency acted sooner that we might have been able to address 
things like mass shortages or ventilator shortages more quickly. He certainly doesn't come off as someone who wants to lean on past administrations that we've often seen with other presidents, you know, who reach out to their predecessors to say, all right, you know, how did you handle this crisis or, you know, maybe get some guidance. However, he did have a chat with Vice President Joe Biden. What more have we learned about that? Yeah, I mean, so that that was this sort of game of chicken almost, where one was saying publicly to the other that they'd love to chat, and eventually they did. Trump said they spoke for about 15 minutes, and it was all about the virus. He previously said when he was asked, look, you know, would you call President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton, you know, would you speak with these folks about you know what they might do and trump said that he would do it uh, president trump excuse me said that he, he would only do it if he thought he could learn something but he didn't think he could learn anything from those other presidents so yeah i mean certainly not uh something that's interesting to him in this regard and of course we're waiting to hear from him shortly we expect a briefing later in the day about the latest um but uh, you know we're really in the phase of you know are we at the peak now or is the peak yet to come overall for the country, I think it's a bit of an open question still, uh, but for individual cities, very much the peak is yet to come. What about Jared Kushner? What about Mr. Navarro? Like, I feel like there's been different people, you know, who've been certainly part of this process. Um, how do they fit in? Who is he? Who is the president really leaning on in all of this? Yeah, I mean, this this has been a key question, and uh, I think that, the, you know, uh, no, uh, excuse me, Navarro was brought in to sort of bash China. It looks like the president's getting started uh, sh- ready to speak here shortly uh, but uh, there's been a question of who is in charge first it was Azar then it was Pence and then sort of Kushner's come into the mix and of course the president himself uh, tends to intervene pretty directly pretty often so uh, you know if, if you're asking me who's in charge it's him and yeah. a bunch of others uh, as well all right, we're going to leave that there because we know you want to watch the president. We're going to take you to the president uh, in just a minute here. Uh, Josh Wingrove, uh, the president of the United States, speaking from the Roosevelt Room. Uh, let's go there now. And uh, if you want, I'll start all over again. I guess they didn't have the mic on. So I'll start all over again. Why not? But I want to thank everybody for being here. It is a great uh, tribute to the banking business. Uh, the money that's been done and the money that's been essentially loaned, these are great loans for the banks and they're great loans for small business, and we appreciate it. We're looking forward to speaking with the top CEOs from the banking industry and finance industry. Some of you I know very well and great relationships with. You do an incredible job, respected all over the world. You're the biggest and the best, and we're meeting to further deepen our partnership to help American families, workers, and small businesses during the pandemic, which is something that nobody ever dreamed of. You know, I say it, and I say it a lot. We had the greatest economy in history, the greatest economy that we've ever had, the greatest economy that anybody's ever had. And then one day they said, you got to close it down, close the country, because we have to get rid of the plague. And that's exactly what we had is a plague. And it's it's uh, we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. You see it. I see it. And I think we're going to go like a rocket ship once we uh, get back to business. There's a lot of pent up energy and demand. But I also want to thank Secretary Mnuchin uh, for the incredible job he's done in uh, conceiving many of these ideas. We talk late into the night and uh, he and his staff have been incredible administrator Carranza, Larry Cudlow and my daughter Ivanka Trump, who just wants to have people working. That's what I gave her lots of options and what do you like? And uh, she created over 15 million jobs working with some of you, but working with the the biggest companies in the world. Uh, They were training and training like uh, nobody's ever seen, but she started off with a goal of 500,000 jobs and now she's up to over 15 million. As our nation wages the war against the invisible enemy, we're grateful for the many ways in which your companies have answered the call to join our national endeavor. Uh, Thank you for donating tens of millions of dollars. Maybe it's not good equipment. But thank you very much for donating uh, tens of millions of dollars for vital supplies and for supporting small businesses across the country. America's small businesses are the backbone of our communities. When you look and we hear all about the big companies that we know so well, but the small companies, when added together, are actually a bigger force. A lot of people 
don't understand that. You do, we do. Our nation's 30 million small businesses employ nearly half of our workforce. My administration will continue to take the boldest action in history to bring immediate relief to the small businesses. So when we open up in a hopefully short, very short period of time, uh, we just, we're back into business. That's what we want. And we have lots of stimulus. So I think we can actually, with the stimulus and with the pent up demand, I think we can really do numbers that are equivalent and maybe even better than we were doing before within a fairly short period of time. That's what my hope is. And that's what the hope of many of you are too. As you know, on Friday, we launched the Paycheck Protection Program to help small businesses keep workers on the payroll. As of today, SBA has processed over $70 billion in guaranteed loans, which is far greater than we would have ever thought at this time, I think, Steve. I don't think we ever had any number like that in mind. That will provide much needed relief for the more than a quarter million businesses that have applied for these loans, and these numbers will continue to rise quickly. Uh, again, far greater than anything we could have expected. We thank you, and we thank the thousands of employees for responding. And by the way, we're going to be going for, it looks like, a very substantial increase in the number because we'll be running out of money pretty quickly, which is a good thing in this case, not a bad thing. And uh, Steve will discuss it, but we're uh, in talks to supplement the fund and do more money, so it's, uh, that's the way it's moving. But we're going to help those small businesses receive these loans in record time, and we look forward to hearing about your incredible progress today, because many of you and most of you are going to be speaking for a couple of minutes just to say what you're doing. And we have a lot of media present. The room is loaded up with media as much as they can, considering we have social distancing. We're practicing social distancing. I don't even know what I'm looking at. I'm not sure they're practicing it as hard as they should be, but they are practicing it, and uh, there's a lot of media. Our entire society is mobilized to defeat the invisible enemy, save lives, and save jobs. Your companies are playing a vital role in this fight, and I'm very, very uh, grateful to you. And with that, I'm going to ask Ivanka to start, and then Secretary Mnuchin, Administrator Carranza, and Larry Cudlow say a few words quickly, and then we're going to get to you. If you have any questions or anything, it would be great. Uh, as I said today, we just asked Congress to pass legislation to fund an additional $250 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program. So we're going to be raising it up to a new level. And the way it's going, we're going to need that because it's really good. People are loving it. They're really loving it. So I'll start with Ivanka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for convening this incredible group of leaders in a socially very responsible way via teleconference. And we appreciate everything that you've been doing. Anyone who knows you knows the heart you have for America's small businesses, over 30 million amazing innovators and entrepreneurs that employ over 60 million people. So just absolutely incredible. And you all have been so instrumental, those that are joining us today, in helping us not only execute in an enormously swift fashion the Paycheck Protection Program, but also answer the President's call. When we began making phone calls a couple of weeks ago to each of you, some of the largest lenders in the country, bankers, credit card companies, we asked you to provide additional relief, private sector driven relief, to our incredible small businesses. And, and you've answered that call. Among the things we've discussed and that you'll announce today include policies that will offer debt relief to your clients and your customers, payment deferrals, forbearance, loan modifications, and outright hardship relief. So we're incredibly excited to have you share um, these initiatives today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Mnuchin and Administrator Carenza and Larry Kudlow to share a little bit about the Paycheck Protection Program and the unbelievable lift that your teams have undertaken in, in just the past week to, to make it as successful as, as it is today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Ivanka. First of all, I want to thank the broad number of banks. We have over 3,000 banks that have been participating since last Friday. That's a combination of community banks, regional banks, and large banks. Uh, I just want to thank the SBA and the Treasury. This is a brand new program that got up and running in less than a week. 
And uh, last Friday, we saw the incredible response. I spoke to the president over the weekend. Uh, I told the president, you know, it was so successful that we were concerned we'd run out of money. The president made very clear that we should go back immediately and ask for more money to make sure we can support small business. Every single one of these people that's employed by a small business is one less person that's out of work and on unemployment insurance. And it's one more person that's part of a business so that when we're ready to reopen, 50% of America's workforce is in small business. Uh, I had the opportunity this morning to speak to Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, and Kevin McCarthy. Uh, I urged them at the president's request that they get us another $250 billion approved, and we look forward to the Senate passing that on Thursday and the House passing that on Friday. This is much needed support, and we want to make sure that every single small business can participate, and we want to assure the workers that if you don't get the loan this week, there'll be plenty of money for you next week. And this isn't just small businesses, it's charities, it is independent contractors, sole proprietors. So again, I just want to thank everybody for their broad participation. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Please. Very quickly, President, the Small Business Administration has a mission of um, strengthening the economy by assisting small businesses. And Ivanka, you mentioned we have 30 million, absolutely, and I think they're all approaching our phone lines as we speak. But we're also committed to sustaining their resiliency, as well as increasing the number of employees they keep on payroll. And so that's been our mission, um, and uh, we have not been um, um, shy of um, accelerating and incorporating and also partnering with not only the the lenders that are on, on this telecom, but many of them. We have over 3,000, 3,200 banks, as the uh, Secretary has mentioned uh, previously, and we have about 300 new lenders. So um, I, I'm very proud of the um, lending community and their partnership. So thank you. Well, thank you. And it's true, the community banks have been incredible. It's uh, really amazing the way they stepped up. They're very happy, and they know many of the people that we're dealing with, so it's uh, really terrific. Uh, Larry Cudlow, please. Thanks, sir. I'll just be brief. Um, I will say that as our mitigation policies have taken hold successfully in dealing with the virus, and as we move to what we believe can be a reopening of the economy in the weeks ahead, we started with a strong foundation, as the president mentioned, and there'll be some uh, there'll be some transitions. But I see no reason why the second half of the year cannot resume a strong, solid growth rate. I think that's an important point, and I think I want to stay as optimistic as possible on that possibility. And we are coming down, I think, the home stretch. That's what the health specialists are telling us. And I want to add one more thing. The president's whole program, the first time in history, is the largest relief assistance program in American history, by far. And his program has been based on a government-public-private partnership every step of the way. We've had everybody here or on these uh, teleconference calls, video calls, whether it's retailers, biotech, pharmas, bankers, transportation, you name it. And that's a characteristic of President Trump's own philosophy that has given us a strong economic foundation. And once we can reopen this thing, I think it's going to be very successful, sir. Thank you very, very much. And as you know, our dollar, our currency has remained very, very strong. Other currencies are not doing well at all. But our currency has done incredibly well, very, very strong. A lot of it assets to that. And sometimes it makes life a little more difficult for going outside of the, the four walls. But it's, uh, it, uh, it means that everybody wants to be in. And we find any time we go out, they just want to jump into our currency. There's nothing like it. And I don't think it's ever been any stronger or better or more powerful, especially relative to other currencies and other nations. I, I think that's a great thing. It's great for all of you. That I know. Ivanka, please. Absolutely. I think the, the foundation of our economy was so incredibly strong until this virus hit. And this is something you recognize. This is something we're hearing from small businesses across the country. This was no fault of their own, and we're going to carry them through this really 
devastating time. And it will be brighter on the other side because of, of commitments such as this, public-private partnerships, and because we will come out of this hopefully sooner rather than later. So with that, I'd love to start with Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America, who was one of the SBA's first partners in implementing the Paycheck Protection Program. Brian, would you like to share with us some thoughts and um, what you'll be announcing today? Uh, sure, thank you. And Mr. President, uh, Ivanka, Secretary Lucian, uh, Secretary Cutlaw, and, and the Beth, uh, we are fast at work doing what we said we do. In March 11th, we met with you at Google Banks and the White House. We talked about consumer relief, mainly uh, deferral payments. Uh, all right. You have been listening to a meeting down there at the White House in the Roosevelt Room. The president, his daughter, and senior advisor Ivanka Trump, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, and others holding a meeting, a virtual meeting, with some of the lenders involved in this small business program. You just heard the beginning there. Uh, Brian Boynihan, the CEO of Bank of America. Carol, and listen, this is at the heart of the stimulus for sure. Well, Absolutely. Or the rescue, I should say. Maybe. Absolutely. And there was a chunk of money, certainly in that initial $2 trillion stimulus plan. We talked about, I think it was about $350 billion for small business loans specifically. What I thought was interesting is we did hear, um, I think, from Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin, who said specifically that the Senate will be passing more loan funds Thursday mm. and then the House on Friday. So, again, looking for more more money to go to small business. How many times do we talk about it? Small business is the U.S. economy. It is some, I think, 80% or, you know, just overwhelmingly, it's what keeps the U.S. economy going. And so, while there was about $350 billion in that first um, phase three, $2 trillion stimulus plan, already Secretary Mnuchin talking about the Senate looking to pass some more funds. So, we'll look for some news more on that a little bit later this week. We'll continue to monitor that conversations as we know. We did start to hear from Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan, but we'll continue to monitor to see if there are any more headlines that come out of that briefing. In the meantime, let's get another check on the business day and another check on trading because we've got a rally, but it's definitely run out of some steam. Let's Indeed, get to Indeed, uh, but we are back on the plus side, Carol Masser, for at least for the NASDAQ Composite Index. The Dow, the S&P also higher as well. Last update, I told you NASDAQ was lower. It has turned around somewhat up by one-tenth of one percent right now. The NASDAQ Composite Positive index higher now by 10 points. Uh, again, a gain of just about one tenth of one percent. S and P 500 index higher by 10. That is a gain of four tenths of one percent. The Dow up by 90 points right now, higher by just about four tenths of one percent. Bottom line, though, at the best level of the session, the Dow had been up more than 900 points in the early going, up 4.1 percent. Stocks paired gains after the S and P 500 index ventured briefly into bullish territory. Oil a major story today. Big sell off there. West Texas Intermediate crude lower by 7.4% right now, 24.15 a barrel. Gold is down 7 tenths of 1% right now, lower by $11 the ounce at 16.49. And one developing story, both Honda and Nissan will temporarily stop paying uh, workers laid off from their idled U.S. plants as the coronavirus stifles demand for cars and trucks. The two Japanese companies have joined unionized Detroit peers in urging furloughed workers to apply for unemployment benefits from state governments. Governments. Recapping equity markets higher, S&P up 8 now, up 3 tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pallett. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Yes, indeed. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Really appreciate the update there. Well, companies, as we know, are retrenching. We talk about cutting back on spending, letting go of workers, stopping buybacks, and conserving cash and cutting costs in light of the virus. Here with what that means for IT spending, the good and the bad, Crawford Del Perret, he's president at IDC Research uh, Xerox, or IDC, forgive me, IDC, and he's on the phone from Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, nice to have you back with us, Crawford. Talk to us a little bit about um, IT spending, because we do know companies are retrenching. Any kind of early data that you guys are seeing? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Carol. Um, 
So we, th- there is some early data. I mean, this has been an extraordinary um, set of circumstances that we've seen. So we were looking at an IT market uh, last year. Um, you know, you're looking at a market that is growing in excess of uh, two years ago, excess of five percent. Last year, excess uh, in, in excess of almost five percent, four point eight percent. In January this year, we were forecasting a market to grow about five point one percent. We've taken that down to the IT market will shrink by almost three percent this year, down about two point seven percent, and that's based on a GDP forecast of about a two percent decline, uh, which is not uncommon. Where IT tends to, uh, you know, get stalled. There's a lot of tangible things that you can stop buying, and then you you tend to see a, a, a slap down. Um, th- there's a lot of characteristics here that are different and uh, different from, say, the cycle that we saw in 2008 uh, and 2009, where we think this might be a little bit less severe. But for sure, we've seen a huge, a huge readjust. And, and not surprisingly, we're seeing it across the board. But of course, we're seeing it in the vertical segments, the industry segments like hospitality transportation, um, and your parts of manufacturing, but we're also seeing it in the category you were just talking about, which is the small and medium business, particularly the emerging companies where they just need to lock down all their expenses and really try to, to, to go into survival mode a bit until we get through this. Well, and survival mode is exactly where I was going to go next, Crawford. You anticipated it so beautifully. You know, this notion that you had a lot of companies, and I mean, I think our company would fall into this category, who probably did some, I I wouldn't call it panic spending, but some unexpected spending to get everybody set up and sort of get people in a place where they could continue operating and, and if not blowing budgets, at least reallocating things. And I wonder how long that takes to sort out. So take us a level down and help us understand what what companies generally are thinking around that. Yeah, so it's a great point, Jason. And we've seen a lot of this, right? We've seen, I, you know, we've been in constant communication with the end customers as well as the intermediary companies, the companies that provide the technology and provide the services. And we've seen that across the board. You know, I've, I've talked to large service providers that have had to stand up uh, health organizations in places like um, uh, large major cities, large government bodies, where you know over a weekend they need an instant, you know, a, a, a new set of laptops for you know multiple hundreds of, of, of customers. Um, you know, good luck if you if you're in the market right now for a laptop as a as a small business or a consumer. We've seen a big surge in demand there. But interestingly, when you get underneath that for the whole year, we actually still think that you'll see. Um, contraction um, in those in those kinds of segments. We think that you know you look at the you look at the PC market, which had had you know a relatively you know nice run. We're looking at you know an IT spending. You know we we expect that market to drop in almost including tablets, almost 10%. We expect the infrastructure market, you know, servers and large storage systems, that'll drop by about 4%. Um, IT services, that'll drop between 2 and 4%. The only category that'll likely show growth, to your point, is interesting. It's the software business. Yeah. Um, that business, we expect, well, and that, that business, will just for perspective, that business was between about 9% growth. That'll go down to about 2% growth. But mm-hmm. again, what, and this is an interesting trend that, you know, we, we've been talking about about for a while, and that is that when you start buying these things as a service, right, you can't shut them off. You've basically bet your business on a lot of these services. So that basically means that you're in it for a penny, you're in it for a pound, and and you're going to continue to buy these services if you're a a thing going forward, which we expect most many, many companies to be. Crawford, you're one of those individuals that we folks at Bloomberg have been talking to for years, and we have talked to you through various crises, whether it's coming out of the financial crisis, you know, whether it's after 9-11. I mean, we have talked to you for a long time about um, the industry and the tech industry, generally speaking. I want to ask you, I mean... I hope you guys are doing okay. I hope your team is doing okay. And I'm curious how you see this virus um, changing the world. I mean, what do you see as the most important, you know, way that the world's going to be different on the other side? Yeah, well, thanks for you know, thanks for that, and and you know we're all doing it as, as best that we can. You know, yeah. we're 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 a company, a thousand people in in fifty countries around the world, and we're all basically working from home right now. But as far as we can tell, most people are safe, and that's 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 very important. So I think that what you're going to see on the other side is a couple of things, and some will be very tangible, and some sorry sorry very um, I think top of mind, and some maybe a little bit less so. I think that one of the most tangible things you'll see are the barriers are going to come down in some things that 
Uh, regulation has been stopping those barriers from coming down. I'm talking about stuff like telemedicine. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to start to see a scenario where, you know what, Um, payers are going to have to get out of the way. And if a person can be diagnosed over a webcam, if a a person can can still be part of the system and get a quality diagnosis, um, whether that's crossing state lines that aren't able to be crossed today, I think those things start to change. So I think we're going to see a big change in in those kinds of services going forward as we come out the other side. I also think we're going to see that how um, the sort of people are willing to work and where they live, I think we might see more of a move to, you know what, it's okay if I don't commute every single day. Yeah. It's okay for me to work at home. You're not going to see that same stigma. I mean, I'm just going to put it out there, that mm. same stigma associated with, you know, what's going on with that person because they're working at home. Well, the fact of the matter is we've proven that the world can be very productive from home. And I think the tools are there, and I think it was re- it's really about things like social norms and social etiquette when you're in the office to be inclusive of the people that are not necessarily in the office. And I think that now with new kinds of services, we're going to be a lot more inclusive on the other side. I think the one that's debatable and one that comes up a lot is what does this do for education? Yeah. And I think for, edu- for education, I think that um, the underserved and the non-served people in emerging regions around the world, they will take advantage of these kinds of tools. But I'm a little more cynical when it comes to the Western education system. I think that, unfortunately, it's a system that's based on classrooms. It's a system that was set up for classrooms. And I just think that um, there's sort of a, an eliteness that comes yep. from being in that classroom at a university and I think we're probably going to fall back into that um, in the future. But I do think that on the other side, this is going to be a moment. I, and it's going to be a moment where things are going to change. Yeah. I agree with you. I think you make some really, really good points. I hope you're right on a lot of them. Uh, and we'd love to keep checking in with you because we know you really have, you and your team, uh, your finger on the pulse of how we think about technology because you've got the data. We love the data. All right. Crawford Del Pret, thank you so much, President of IDC International Data Corp, joining us on the phone from Framingham, Massachusetts. Carol? All right, let's get back to uh, your top business stories and an update on the trading session. Here is Charlie Pellet. Hi, thank you very much. We've got 29 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell, working from home. Can't wait to get back to the office to see you guys in person. Here's what's going on. We have got the Dow, the S&P there, both higher. NASDAQ on the minus side right now. S&P, bottom line there, looking at a little change. Don by Bloomberg here up three points. That's a game of just under two tenths of one percent. NASDAQ down 12, dropping just about two tenths of one percent. Dow Industrials up 33. That is a gain of two tenths of one percent. Bottom line key takeaway, stocks now fluctuating as investors weigh whether the spread of the coronavirus may be slowing in several major economies. Oil sinking as investors weigh whether the world's biggest producers will be able to strike a deal that cuts enough output. We've got West Texas Intermediate Crude down seven percent now, down $1.85 a barrel, 20 423 on WTI. Brent 3214 lower by just about 3%. Gold down 5 tenths lower by $8 the ounce at 1652. Again, the 10 year down 18 30 seconds with a yield of 0.72%. NASDAQ fluctuating between gains and losses back now on the plus side, higher by a point. Stay with Bloomberg for the latest. 29 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell. Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte has announced new economic measures as his country enters its fifth week of lockdown. Down, with all non-essential businesses shuttered and still no plan to relax restrictions. Alessandro Rabucci is associate professor at the Johns Hopkins University Cary Business School. He spoke this morning with Bloomberg Television about the economic strain in Italy caused by the coronavirus. Italy is in a particularly difficult situation because it was already experiencing difficulty to recover from the global financial crisis. Effectively, Italy never recovered from the global financial crisis. The growth was permanently hit by that shock. The Bloomberg School of Public Health is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder and majority owner of Bloomberg LP, parent company of Bloomberg News. Macy's says Chief Financial Officer Paula Price is leaving after less than two years. The retailer is in the middle of navigating a broad U.S. shutdown of non-essential businesses. Her departure comes amid a massive retail shutdown, part of unprecedented measures to halt the spread of the coronavirus. Macy's shares are there up by 3%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week right here on Bloomberg Radio. 
Going to Carol Masser's childhood here, I, Dave oh, Wilson. Oh my God! You make me warm and fuzzy, Dave. What was the thing yesterday that you were picking up? Oh, it was, it was the, uh, who. the Who. It was the Who. Yeah, today, the Grateful, Grateful Dead. Dead. Man, wow. you're just taking her back to her childhood in New we're Jersey. Get some I love it. Yes, and maybe some Jethro Tull later in the week, and God, throw some Rush in there just to uh, <laughs> you know remind you of your brothers. Be like, turn it down, <laughs> turn it down. <laughs> that was my dad. My mom was cool. My dad was like, turn it down. <laughs> all right, Dave Wilson back with us with his chart of the day. I can see him all the way in New Jersey. You know, chuckling and maybe rolling his eyes at us a bit. I think he's yeah, wearing. Wait, wait, right, are you Jersey. wearing sweats and yoga pants? I just want to know, Dave. Has I it come am down not. to that? All right. <laughs> I Although uh, I, I am wearing a T-shirt, so I'm kind of in your camp right. at this point, Jason. Yep. All right right just, there with you, Dave. Just checking on it. Anyway, so going down the road feeling bad to me kind of describes what may lie ahead for investors when it comes to dividends. Now, you know, we found out today ExxonMobil's cutting all these costs to uh, maintain their payout. But a lot of other companies are uh, reducing it. I mean, think about Occidental Petroleum and Apache and the energy patches, two examples there. And so the question becomes, what lies ahead for dividends? And you can actually go to the futures market to get an idea of what investors are expecting. Uh, there are S&P 500 dividend futures, and the more actively traded ones are based on payouts over 12-month periods ended in December, uh, basically when a contract expires, so the third Friday in December, it more or less coincides with the uh, calendar year. But what's interesting is, you know, as we saw stocks fall in the last month and a half, we also saw the dividend, in essence, associated with these futures contracts decline as well. So now, if you look at the one that expires this December... At least, you know, as of yesterday, it was pricing in a 28% drop in payouts for S&P 500 companies for the year. Now, bear in mind, some of these dividends have already been paid, and S&P actually keeps track of it. Uh, they have the index, in essence, that underlies these futures contracts. So, you know, every day as companies make their payments, uh, you know, the, the value of the index rises accordingly. And when you run the numbers, you find out that if you were to have taken the close from yesterday for the December contract and then applied that based on the dividends that have already been paid through December, you're talking about a 41% drop in payouts. I mean, it's just pretty stunning what people are anticipating. And that's worse than anything you saw Back in 2008 or 2009 during the financial crisis. And in fact, if, if you just looked at the value built into the futures, down as much as 37% from a high in February, you go out to next year because our annual contracts all the way out to 2020. You look at the one that expires in December 2021, down as much as 47% from its high in February and actually sort of in, anticipating a further decline in dividends next year. So, you know... Look for those dividend checks to get smaller, I think, is the long and the short of it, at least based on this futures indicator. And if you want to know more, folks, send me an email. I'll get you the chart, the explanation that goes with it, and everything I do going forward. The email address is dwilson at bloomberg.net. That's dwilson at bloomberg.net. All right, Dave Wilson, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And certainly a theme that we've been hearing, Carol, about, yeah. you know, buybacks, dividends, uh, definitely entering a new era. I do want to bring you a headline crossing the Bloomberg uh, right now. Multiple uh, news outlets reporting, CNN and AP uh, and Dow Jones, all reporting that acting Navy Secretary Thomas Modley resigned today. This, of course, following an uproar after he excoriated the former captain of the USS Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, that captain's crew had become stricken with the coronavirus. He put out the word about that, and this acting secretary, now it seemed to be former uh, acting Navy secretary, went to the ship and went on basically sort of a tirade, 
belittled the captain, uh, had some comments about China, the U.S. media, and others. So he is stepping down. Right. Mildly uh, apologizing, right, uh, for an address he gave to that ship's crew after that firing. He had said that Crozier was too naive or too stupid to not realize that the letter would leak. Um, So, I mean, this has been an ongoing controversy over the last week or so having to do with, um, as you said, the USS Theodore Roosevelt, where there were a bunch of members uh, on that ship uh, that were showing signs of the virus and um, certainly the captain revealing what was going on right. and getting some attention for that, getting a lot of attention for that. Well, and not only getting attention, but when he essentially left his post, he was uh, sent off with, you know, thunderous applause and ovation from his crew, you know, to, to whom he was their CO, his commanding officer. So uh, it has been a moment uh, sort of in this whole crisis that yeah. certainly struck a, a lot of people and, you know, amid a lot of shuffling candidly that that's going on and some personnel changes you know including the white house press secretary uh resigning after holding exactly zero uh press briefings there in the uh, James Brady room. So uh, we've got a new press secretary coming to the fore there. So some Crises movement there in the administration. brings changes, right, as things indeed. are revealed. Well, and um, when it comes to the White House, we should point out there's a new chief of staff, of course, uh, Mark Meadows, uh, coming in, resigning from Congress to become the president's new chief of staff. So that headline yeah. about the acting Navy secretary resigning, uh, spiking here on the Bloomberg. All right, let's get a check on World of National News headlines. Over to Bob Moon we go. Hey, Bob. Carol, Acting Navy Secretary Thomas Motley has resigned this a day after leaked audio in which he was heard calling the ousted commander of the USS Theodore Roosevelt stupid for expressing concerns over coronavirus sweeping his ship in an address to the ship's crew. They are being forced to risk their lives to vote in Wisconsin's primary election today at the insistence of Republican leaders. The lines have been particularly long in Milwaukee, where just five of the 180 traditional polling places are open. In Oshkosh, polling worker Debbie Travis says they've been trying to minimize the risks. We're sanitizing the doors. We're sanitizing the voting booths. We're sanitizing the pens they use. We're sanitizing anything they touch. Many voters across Wisconsin have not been wearing facial coverings today, ignoring public health recommendations. Some Republican officials who resisted efforts to postpone the election were called in to help run voting sites after thousands of election workers stepped down, fearing for their safety. There are early indications that New York is seeing a plateau in the number of people who have been hospitalized for COVID-19. But Governor Andrew Cuomo also warns social distancing mandates need to stay in place and need to be followed for the foreseeable future. This virus is very good at what it does, and it kills vulnerable people. That's what it does. And it does that very well. And we can't stop that. The question is... Are you saving everyone you can save? Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. I'm Bob Moon. Asset managers who seize change to launch new strategies, add distribution channels, or exploit new technology to re-engineer the investor experience are often rewarded. However, in an industry paralyzed with complexity, few act with agility or decisively. Few run their businesses strategically, yet the most competitive managers in the market know with the right partner and a flexible operating system, you can. Go boldly toward change with SEI Investment Manager Services. I'm Steve Meyer, president of SEI's Investment Manager Services. At SEI, We understand the emerging forces that will define success for asset managers and what firms will need to compete tomorrow. That's why we continually optimize SEI's global operating platform. If your business requires greater agility, our advanced technology, integrated best-in-class systems, and multi-asset expertise can be your catalyst for business transformation. With SEI Investment Manager Services, you lead the charge in a competitive marketplace. Learn more at seic.com slash seize change. Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants 
as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. The local M&S food hall and food sections in our larger stores are open, and we're here for you in these challenging times. Our shelves are restocked regularly with deliveries from our fantastic suppliers, so you can get all the fresh food and essentials you need. For local store information, visit MarksAndSpencer.com. We're all in this together. This is not just food. This is M&S food. Because you can't watch Trolls World Tour at the cinema, Sky Store is bringing the cinema home to you with Sky Store Premiere. I'm going to destroy all music except for rock. We need to unite the trolls to save all music. Our brand new service that lets you watch movies at home that would normally be in the cinema. Rock and roll! Let's go save the world! Prepare for battle. This ought to be good. Enjoy Trolls World Tour now on Sky Store Premiere, bringing the cinema to you. Right now, Talk Talk TV and Faster Fibre is just £25.50 a month, fixed for 18 months. Plus, you get a year of Amazon Prime on us, over 80 Freeview channels, all the on-demand players and average speeds of 38 megabits per second. Plus, unlimited one-day delivery, thousands of movies, TV shows and more from Amazon. Massive entertainment package, tiny price. See if you want to spend on popcorn. Search Talk Talk TV. Talk Talk for everyone. Offer ends 22nd of April, subject to availability. T's and C's apply. Get your MLB fix with these great podcasts on TuneIn. Fill your seventh inning stretch with the Ringer MLB show. It's a, it's a, I just can't get over it. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, Jeter Downs. Didn't realize he was a top. Like, like my dad is drinking the Kool-Aid on this. He's like, oh, of course. you know, Mookie was going to leave. I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know that. Slide into second with the Starting Nine podcast. Nolan Arenado slides right into the top spot wow. for a favorite baseball player active in the league right now. It is a pleasure to be sitting next to you, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. this is, uh, the, we've been waiting a long time for this. We actually, in terms of like Four active players, the bases with the StatCast podcast. Uh, ways of going about it. You know, I picked third, so it, in some ways it made it easier to me, for me, you know, Mike, uh, just to go over the first couple of picks, you know, Mike took Barry Bonds, who I think was kind of the obvious guy to take number one, not only Catch these and more MLB podcasts right here on TuneIn. Are we at war with COVID-19? The metaphor of choice is framing the way we confront the crisis and not in a good way. This virus does not have intent. It can't be negotiated with. There will be no truce. Also in this time of national unity, should celebrities just shut up? Don't miss this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On The Media podcast on TuneIn today. Behind the highlight reels, championship rings, and colossal paychecks, there are sports stories that fuel, deepen, and even challenge our love for the game. For true tales of underdogs, antiheroes, and game-changing innovators, explore a sports documentary on TuneIn. Like Sports Wars, telling the origin stories of classic rivalries. Ray's Sports, about the concussion crisis that threatens football's future. And Dunkumentaries, a podcast devoted to the beauty and power of the slam dunk. For these and more, search Sports Documentaries on TuneIn. Lines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We've got 13 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell here with the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all holding on to gains. Investors, though, are debating if the spread of the coronavirus is slowing in several major economies. Oil is lower. On concern, the world's biggest producers will not be able to strike a deal that cuts enough output. We've got West Texas intermediate crude dropping 6.5%, 24.38 a barrel. Brent, 32.25, lower by 2.4%. Here's where we stand in terms of U.S. equity markets. S&P up 31. That is a gain of 1.2%. The Dow up 301 points, up by 1.3%. NASDAQ up 54. That is a gain of 7 tenths of 1%. Tenure down 17.30 seconds with the yield... 0.1%. 
1.72%, and gold down two tenths of 1% at 16.58 the ounce. So again, recapping here, equities are 12 minutes to go ahead of the close. S&P up 31, a gain of 1.1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. How about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive home. Smells great. I want to drive. Just drive, baby. It's the question that drives us. Drive. The drive to the close. That funky music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. It is time for the drive to the close. Back with us is George Mateo, Chief Investment Officer at Key Private Bank, joining us on the phone from Cleveland. George, nice to have you here with us. Um, how do you look at this market? Bear market, or could we be uh, at the beginning of a new bull market? Well, great to be with you, and thanks for having me back. You know, I think it's probably a bit of both. I mean, I think we're just going to be in this sideways shop for a while, so we'll have days like today where we'll feel good about things, and days will feel probably a little less good. So I think we just have to kind of fasten our seatbelt and hold on. And so what are you hearing from uh, customers and, and clients? And, and one of the reasons I'm especially interested to, I think we're both interested to hear you uh, answer that, George, is because you're not in New York City. You're there in, in Cleveland. And obviously, I think this crisis looks, uh, while broadly the same, maybe individually, locally, and regionally, a little bit different. So how are, how are people reacting? How are they interacting with you? Yeah, well, I hope you both are keeping safe, too, and all your listeners, for sure. I mean, I think Ohio is a little bit ahead of the curve. It seems like we've had a pretty progressive governor uh, get out in front of this, but I think everybody is still in the same level of anxiety where, wherever you live, uh, and that just kind of fuels more anxiety to some extent. But I think people are trying to be measured about it and trying to kind of maintain their composure, and investors need to do the same thing. So, you know, in spite of all this uncertainty, we really want to encourage people to maintain their long-term discipline and, and stay stay in the market to the extent they can and really stick to their long-term plan. And that's really the message we've been trying to emphasize. How many, though, of your clients, their long-term plan has really been upended by such a dramatic pullback in the equity markets? You know, good question, Charles. Not a lot, though. I mean, I think people... Um, not to this extent, certainly, but I think people might have been anticipating some degree of volatility. We try to take a long-term approach. We try to counsel clients to expect volatility will be a, a feature of the investment uh, landscape. Again, the magnitude has probably been uh, unprecedented for sure. Uh, not often used word, but I think it fits. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think people know that volatility is something that kind of comes with the territory. So we've got some great financial planning tools and techniques that really kind of focus that on, uh, focus on that first. And then from there, you can really hopefully build a long-term investment plan and stick to it in markets like today. So, George, we love talking names with you. Tell us about Microsoft. I'm especially interested because we had a great conversation just a little while ago with Crawford Del Pret over at IDC, you know, talking about uh, IT spending. But one of the bright spots, and maybe this is why you have this pick, uh, is around software. That obviously is an area where we've seen tremendous growth, and, and his team is essentially predicting that it's the one area in IT where we might still uh, see a little bit of optimism this year. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think it, again, speaks to the notion of really finding high-quality companies with really strong balance sheets, you know, people or companies that are led by strong management teams, and, and people can really identify with their services. Software, I think you're right, is kind of a go-to area. It's kind of a good core defensive name uh, within mm-hmm. the tech landscape. Really strong cash flow generation, strong balance sheet, good earnings visibility. I mean, everybody's earning visibility is a little bit uh, mired these days, but we think that Microsoft can shine through an environment like this going forward. A lot of good sector tailwinds at their back, too, that really can uh, drive that growth forward, we think. So does that mean when it dipped to below 140, uh, well below 140, that you guys were doing some buying? I think uh, the low, I'm just looking, the most recent low was around 134 and change or so. Did you do a bunch of buying into Microsoft? I don't think we did a bunch of buying, but yeah, we've been nibbling at it uh, for okay. sure. It, it, it's come back, and um, you know, we still like the name, though. So on a long term basis, we, we just be buying it today. Actually, what about something like a Dollar General? We yeah, I love Dollar l- General. Yeah, we talk about this a lot, and we've been talking, um, Jason and I, about the overall retail sector and what's going mm-hmm. on. Um, tell us a bit about what your what your thesis is for this one. 
Well, to some extent, they're kind of a master of their own destiny. I mean, certainly the macro environment is going to be a, a headwind for a lot of folks, and hopefully these, these things are more short-term in nature, but they really do offer the best-of-breed format uh, within kind of a smaller size box. Um, they've got some really good levers they can pull to try and, and enhance their merchandising. They've got some new um, initiatives that are really um, poised for some growth going forward. They've also got an environment where their, their closest competitor is a little bit um, hampered in the, in the near term. And so I think there's a lot of things they can do to kind of uh, get through this better than others. So I think they're well positioned over the long term as well. Well, and it's interesting to think about that name too, George, right? Like knowing enough to be dangerous about their history. You know, KKR bought them kind of at the tail end of the last boom, right before the financial crisis. And it was a great name to have as we went into a period of economic uncertainty where a discount uh, retailer may be more attractive and they are servicing uh, a big chunk of the country that is largely under market uh, or under marketed or under, uh, under retail in a lot of ways, yeah. right? Underserved, yeah, I agree with you, yeah, wholeheartedly. I think that's a that's a key uh, part of the thesis for sure. But I do you know wonder. I, mean? I do wonder too. That's going to be the segment of I feel like our population that's going to be hit the hardest. So, does a dollar general benefit or get hurt because of that? You know, there, there are some short term headwinds for sure, but I think that they they proved to be seller operators. Uh, they're finding people. They're finding uh, ways to get people into the store. Some convenient options they've set up at the back of the store that allow people to pick up their goods, um, you know, without having to go in the store are a big part of their growth also. Um, but again, I think they're really kind of focusing on that core demographic, really freshen up the stores a little bit too, which will actually hopefully drive traffic. And adding new categories uh, like food, for example, will be another key driver for that, and people still need to eat. Yeah, well, and one exactly, and one of the things that they have on their side, I think, right, uh, George, is this notion that they are in these underserved markets, and it, it's sort of the general part of the Dollar General that like they're the only game in town, or one of the few games in town in a lot of these more uh, rural parts of the South and, and elsewhere. I think that's right. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. The general part of the store is just the Dollar General. I think that's a good analogy. Yeah, they've definitely been hiring. I was just looking at some of the most recent headlines. They're hiring up to 50,000 new employees to support their operations. By the end of April, they were doing that. And then they were also giving a bunch of their employees a bunch of bonuses, like $35 million in bonuses. Yeah, Yeah. no, it's really interesting. Uh, Great great to catch up with you. We really appreciate it. Uh, George Mateo is Chief Investment Officer at a key private bank stay uh, safe. on the phone from Cleveland. We hope you and your team uh, stay safe and, and hope you guys continue to be ahead of the curve, as you say. Uh, Mike DeWine, I believe, the governor of Ohio, uh, as George pointed out, you know, he mm. was one of the first. He moved the primary back. You know, there were a lot yeah, of uh, big actions right. uh, that uh, he was taking. I believe he's a Republican, too. You know, so it, it's an interesting uh, case study in in many ways as we continue to talk about uh, governors and and whatnot. So interesting to hear his perspective uh, as always. Well, the market a little more uh, skeptimistic I think as we've gone on. Skeptimistic. uh, We've definitely run out of steam. We had quite a rally kind of earlier on in the day. Uh, We're just flat on the NASDAQ, a little bit higher on the Dow and uh, relatively flat on the S&P as well. Stick around though. We'll have those closing numbers and a look at some of the stocks on the move in the Tuesday trade. This is Bloomberg. Because you can't watch Trolls World Tour at the cinema, Sky Store is bringing the cinema home to you with Sky Store Premiere. I'm going to destroy all music except for rock. We need to unite the trolls to save all music. Our brand new service that lets you watch movies at home that would normally be in the cinema. Rock and roll! Let's go save the world! Yes! Prepare for battle. This ought to be good. Enjoy Trolls World Tour now on Sky Store Premiere, bringing the cinema to you. Are we at war with COVID-19? The metaphor of choice is framing the way we confront the crisis, and not in a good way. This virus does not have intent. It can't be negotiated with. There will be no truce. Also, in this time of national unity, should celebrities just shut up? Don't miss this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. Tune in makes it easy to be a part of the conversation. Just make sure push notifications are enabled to hear about breaking news and trending topics from around the sports world. You'll also get custom recommendations of podcasts and radio stations covering the sports and teams you care about. 
Get your MLB fix with these great podcasts on TuneIn. Fill your seventh inning stretch with the Ringer MLB show. It's a, it's a, I just can't get over it. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, Jeter Downs didn't realize he was a top. Like, my dad is drinking the Kool-Aid on this. He's like, oh, of course. you know, Mookie was going to leave. I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know that. Slide into second with the Starting Nine podcast. Nolan Arenado slides right into the top spot mm. wow. for favorite baseball player active in the league right now. It is a pleasure to be sitting next to you, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. this is, uh, the, we've been waiting a long time for this. We actually, in terms of like Four, active... Four, the bases with the StatCast podcast. Uh, ways of going about it. You know, I picked third, so it, in some ways it made it easier to me, for me, you know, Mike, uh, just to go over the first couple of picks, you know, Mike took Barry Bonds, who I think was kind of the obvious guy to take number one, not only Catch these and more MLB podcasts right here on TuneIn. Get your daily dose of NFL shop talk with these great podcasts on TuneIn. Start your morning off right with Around the NFL. Injured, depleted roster into the playoffs, and I didn't think they belonged in the playoffs. Mm. I think overall, though, it, it was a great divisional round weekend because you got the first one. Run into again. the end zone with the Move the Sticks podcast. We had a fun little um, Zoom cocktail hour last night. Oh, yeah. What a star-studded affair. <laughs> Greg, you were there for the earlier part, but it really popped off um, a little later on. We had Zach Goldman. And right. dive deep into the sidelines with the Peter King Podcast. On the occasion of his 50th birthday, come down and record a little bit of retrospective on the life and times of Brett Lorenzo Favre. That sounds like a bestseller. It's, no, it sounds like a precursor to a funeral. That's what it is. Uh, I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> Explore these and more hard-hitting NFL podcasts right here on TuneIn. <laughs> the financial capital of the world. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Turned out to be a losing day on Wall Street with the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all giving up gains. Stocks did fluctuate for much of the session. In the end, though, a losing day. Those gains fizzling seconds before the closing bell there with the S&P down four, a drop of two-tenths of one percent. Dow Jones Industrial average fell 34 points, a drop just about two tenths of one percent, and Nasdaq was down 26 points, a decline there of three tenths of one percent. Oil uh, sank today as investors weighed whether the world's biggest producers will be able to strike a deal that cuts enough output. West Texas Intermediate crude down 5.9 percent, down a dollar 53 a barrel at 24.55. S&P 500 index have been up as much as three and a half percent again. End of the day lower down four points with a drop at the close of just about two-tenths of one percent. Now, what about stimulus and markets? Bob Michael is Chief Investment Officer at J.P. Morgan Chase. I think when you look at these programs and you feel the sense of relief, you need to play it through further. You need to get into the second um, quarter and into the third quarter and say, are families that are actually collecting unemployment insurance, that are actually getting the 600 a week subsidy, do they really feel confident to go out and increase their discretionary spending? I don't think so. Airline stocks, for the most part, moved higher today. American Airlines was up by 7.6%. United was down, uh, was up 1.9%. It was Delta, though, that moved from a gain to a loss, falling by three-tenths of 1%. Southwest Airlines up by 6.7%. Big day for a lot of the discount carriers. Uh, among them, uh, Spirit Airlines up today by 8.9%, and Allegiant rallied by 9%. So again, recapping on the equity numbers, the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all having a losing day. The tender down 15 30 seconds, yield 0.71%. At the close, S&P fell almost five points, down two-tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Nobody move a muscle. Damn, Shippy, you got to move. And I'm moving on, moving on from town to town. Time is money. Let's go. Come on, move it. Shake it up. Shake it up. 
Bloomberg Business Week, Movers and Shakers, with Carol Mazur and Jason Kelly on Bloomberg Radio. All right, two days in, you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Mazur along with Jason Kelly. So big picture, you heard Charlie talking about those major equity averages. We really did run out of steam there from an earlier yeah. rally, right? I mean, just... Kind of petered um, out. Yeah, still in the S&P 500, you had 306 names managing to end higher on the day, 199 lower, Jason. So we did see some, you know, positive momentum. A lot of names, though, to the upside, big time retail. Yeah, retail uh, coming back. And it's hard to say whether that is about sort of optimism, like we heard from Larry Kudlow, the president's chief economic advisor, about the economy, you know, reopening in four to eight weeks, whether it is other commentary or just, you know, a little bit of optimism that we're hearing about some peaking when it comes to cases but you know Kohl's was your number one gainer up 20% Capri Holdings up 19% PVH uh, up 18% so some not insubstantial gains in a lot of ways and as you say on a day where uh, the S&P ended up essentially flat but you know what I'm going to say flat feels okay yeah, flat feels okay. That's some stability, right? It's yeah. not getting worse and stuff. What I will say about those retail names is I think it's also at some point folks start to look at them and say, all right, I do expect Kohl's to be there when we get back. And so this stock has been beaten yeah. up. You know, is it an opportunity? Um, and I do think if you look at some of these wild swings, it doesn't mean we won't have more wild swings depending on the day-to-day news and what's going on. But nonetheless, you know, there could be some investors just kind of looking and saying, Okay, maybe this is an opportunity. All right. So well, you and yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, no, I mean, no, I was just ahead, I was just going to add. You know, it goes back to the conversation we had um, with George Mateo just a minute ago. You know, Dollar General is sort of waxed rhapsodic about it, but uh, only because I wrote a chapter about Dollar General in my book um, about the private <laughs> and equity that, industry. And the title of that book: uh, The New Tycoons Inside the Private Equity Industry That Owns Everything. <laughs> uh, pick blood, it up. It's good. Go for good it. quarantine reading. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's a it's a fascinating it's study from, uh, in. Yeah. A Agreed. retailer in the sense it was owned by private equity, but really, I mean, this is about a retailer that's going to thrive potentially mm-hmm. in a tougher economic uh, market. So, and, and Kohl's, it should be pointed out, is not a high-end retailer. This is something that you know a wider swath of America right. can afford and does shop at. So you mentioned Kohl's was up 20%, Capri was up 19%, PVH, which is home to brands like Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, Arrow, Warners, you name it, they were up almost 18%. So some big moves to the upside. Uh, Boeing, uh, one of your uh, laggers there, and it's because uh, some, uh, first of all, halting all jet assembly with closing the last 787 plant, but also regulator test flight of that 737 MAX is delayed, so uh, maybe not surprising to see that stock down. It was one of your worst performers on the S&P down almost 5%. Yeah, here's a little bit more on the big picture, too. Materials, your top performer in the S&P 500 overall as a group, 2.6% higher. Energy names bouncing back up 2.25%, Jason, and then consumer discretionary, and that's on the optimism that you know, maybe, yeah. you know, people starting to think about, okay, how we come back. That as a group was up 1.4%. Bottom of the pack, the staples, right. consumer because staples down about 1% overall, and utilities were down 1.1%, often seen as a much more conservative play. All right, taking a quick look at volatility. Nice to have the VIX down below 50 again, uh, up uh, right? slightly <laughs> today. What's that? Who'd have thought? Down below 50. I uh, know, down below 50 feels good. I remember when it was at 12, <laughs> but uh, it closed yeah. uh, up just a touch, up 3%. Settling down at 46.59. This is Boomer. All right, Dave, you're up. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Dave. Just what do you think you're doing, Dave? We're going for a price on Wilson. Open up the door, it's Dave. Who? Dave. Hey, Mr. Wilson, let's get to your stock of the day. Not one that I'm familiar with, but the uh, ticker is GLNG. So tell us about this one. I'm assuming it plays into the LNG area. You are correct, because the company's name is Golar LNG. It's a ship owner that focuses on liquefied natural gas. Company owns ships that carry LNG across the water, provide what's called floating storage, and process natural gas into LNG. Golar was founded in 1946 and has been in the LNG ship business since the 1970s. The company's been listed on NASDAQ since 2002, and yes, the ticker is GLNG. 
Golar peaked at a record in 2014 after a six-month surge. The gains were short-lived, though, and the shares lost more than half of their value in 2018 and 2019 combined. Golar has fallen further in 2020 and traded today at its lowest price in almost 11 years. The latest drop followed the company's disclosure that BP wants to delay delivery of a processing ship that will operate off the coast of West Africa. Golar said it received a notice from the UK energy company that invoked force majeure or unforeseen circumstances. More specifically, the outbreak of coronavirus. BP is due to receive the ship in 2022 and wants to push that date back by a year. The prospect was enough to send Golar shares to their second biggest loss ever. They tumbled more than 24% on the day. They were down a little more than 25% uh, back in May 2018. Huh. All right. Interesting. Yeah, uh, interesting one, Dave Wilson. We really appreciate it. As always, Dave Wilson, our stocks editor, author of the chart, Stock of the Day, always giving us some good market insights for sure. He yeah. sets the Business Week agenda every day. Dave yeah, Wilson. absolutely. Well, and he's I wearing love- a T-shirt today. <laughs> That's a hot take. I never said. I don't know if I've ever seen him not wear a tie. <laughs> That's true. Right? Maybe it's a tie with a T-shirt. We'll have to check in on that one. <laughs> A tie with a t-shirt or a t-shirt with a tie? Or, yeah, t-shirt with a tie, tie with a Whatever. t-shirt. Well, I don't know, you yeah. know. Coming con- up, we're going to talk to Susan To be Lyon. continued, I'm just going to say. Yeah, we're going to talk with we- Susan Lyon. Very yes. uh, excited to, to, to uh, touch base with her. The media landscape has also uh, changed a lot. And speaking of the media landscape changing, we're going to catch up with Meg Whitman, CEO yeah, of Quibi. Exactly. See what they have to say both. Uh, Susan, I want to hear what she has to say about the por- her portfolio companies. It's a diverse portfolio, so see how everybody's doing uh, in this current environment. And then, of course, Quibi. It made its debut yesterday, so we'll see what Meg Whitman has to say. In the meantime, let's get back to World of National News headlines. Ed Baxter in San Francisco with the latest. Hey, Ed. All right, Carol. Hello there. New York City has had its deadliest day to date. Also, its third day of below peak infections. Interesting numbers. Governor Andrew Cuomo says separation seems to be having an effect on the projected curve of cases. Right now, we're projecting that we are Uh, reaching a plateau in the total number of hospitalizations, and you can see the growth, and you see it starting to flatten. Again, this is a projection. It still depends on what we do. And he says it's going to come down to how good we are with testing. He says that sometime we'll have to restart life. In the macro picture on that topic, Surgeon General Jerome Adams says it will happen. I want the American people to know there is a light at the end of this tunnel, and uh, we, we feel confident and if we keep doing the right thing for the rest of this month, that we can start to slowly reopen in some places. Yeah, both say so mitigation is working right. and that this will be a very painful week as well. Uh, same thing, California curve flattening a bit as well. Expectation of a tough week. The focus of Governor Gavin Newsom, interesting today, news conference, was on helping people cope with stress. Uh, he says guidance is showing up. And to meet uh, these challenges head on and to be there and extend a hand for you at this time of great stress uh, and need. He says stress can cause a myriad of health problems, even for people not directly affected by the virus. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson remains ICU. He remains stable overnight. He's receiving standard oxygen treatment and breathing without any assistance. He's not required any mechanical ventilation or non-invasive respiratory support. Foreign Minister Dominic Rabb in San Francisco. I'm Ed Baxter. This is Bloomberg. There are times when you have to go it alone, but these should not be those times. With a medical crisis, can any other central bank execute? Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Jonathan Farrell. Walk me through the dynamics that are going to shape the euro in the coming months. Weekday mornings at 7 Eastern. Do we have the ability to coordinate with this virus? On Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and BloombergRadio.com. When things move this quick, do things break? Bloomberg, the world is listening. My mother was always very active and independent, and she was familiar with her neighborhood. But one day, she stopped at the stop sign for much longer than usual. She wasn't even really sure where she was at. It's very important for you to talk to someone about it. I felt so much better after my son told me, Mom, we'll figure it out. When something feels different, it could be Alzheimer's. Now is the time to talk. Visit alz.org slash ourstories to learn more. A message from the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. Are you interested in a challenging and exciting career? One where you can be part of solving complex challenges across industries and geographies. 
Bloomberg's ever-expanding technology, data, news, and media services foster innovation, empower clients, and offer nearly limitless opportunities for career growth. Visit Bloomberg.com slash careers today to view our current job opportunities. Bloomberg LP is an equal opportunity employer. The address once again is Bloomberg.com slash careers. One in three adults has pre-diabetes. One in three. That means it could be you, your football buddy, your football buddy, or you, your best man, your worst man, you, your dog walker, your cat From jogger. Singapore. While one in three adults has pre-diabetes, with early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its pre-diabetes awareness partners. The sports world is full of inspirational stories of heroic figures. It also has its fair share of shady characters. Aaron Hernandez, Donald Sterling, Vikram Chabri, O.J. Simpson. For detailed retellings of some of the darkest sagas in sports, search sports documentaries on the TuneIn app. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. TuneIn makes it easy to be a part of the conversation. Just make sure push notifications are enabled to hear about breaking news and trending topics from around the sports world. You'll also get custom recommendations of podcasts and radio stations covering the sports and teams you care about. Get your MLB fix with these great podcasts on TuneIn. Fill your seventh inning stretch with the Ringer MLB show. It's, a, it's a, I just can't get over it. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, Jeter Downs didn't realize he was a top. Like, my dad is drinking the Kool-Aid on this. He's like, oh, of course. you know, Mookie was going to leave. I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know that. Slide into second with the Starting oh, Nine dude. podcast. Nolan Arenado slides right into the top spot wow. for favorite baseball player active in the league right now. It is a pleasure to be sitting next to you, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. this is, uh, the, we've been waiting a long time for this. We actually, in terms of like Four, active... Four, the bases with the StatCast podcast. Uh, ways of going about it. You know, I picked third, so it, in some ways it made it easier to me, for me, you know, Mike, uh, just to go over the first couple of picks, you know, Mike took Barry Bonds, who I think was kind of the obvious guy to take number one, not only Catch these and more MLB podcasts right here on TuneIn. Get your daily dose of NFL shop talk with these great podcasts on TuneIn. Start your morning off right with Around the NFL. Injured, depleted roster into the playoffs, and I didn't think they belonged in the playoffs. Mm. I think overall, though, it, it was a great divisional round weekend because you got the first one. Run into the end zone with the Move the Sticks podcast. We had a fun little um, Zoom cocktail hour last night. Oh, yeah. What a star-studded affair. <laughs> Greg, you were there for the earlier part, but it really popped off um, a little later on. We had Zach Goldman. And Rob. dive deep into the sidelines with the Peter King Podcast. On the occasion of his 50th birthday, come down and record a little bit of retrospective on the life and times of Brett Lorenzo Favre. That sounds like a bestseller. It's, no, it sounds like a precursor to a funeral. That's what it is. Uh, I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> Explore these and more hard-hitting NFL podcasts right here on TuneIn. Are we at war with COVID-19? The metaphor of choice is framing the way we confront the crisis, and not in a good way. This virus does not have intent. It can't be negotiated with. There will be no truce. Also, in this time of national unity, should celebrities just shut up? Don't miss this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. April 7th, 2019, retiring NBA legends Dirk Nowitzki and Dwayne Wade play their final home games, both resulting in victories. And now, your greatest level, Dirk Certainly want to win it for Wade here at home in his final game in this building. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. 
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Turned out to be a losing day for the U.S. stock market. Stocks closed lower in volatile trading as investors debated whether the spread of the coronavirus may be slowing in several major economies. S&P 500 index down two-tenths of one percent after surging as much as three and a half percent. S&P ending the day lower by four points. The benchmark briefly met the time-honored definition for the start of bull market after climbing 20% from its March 23rd low. The Dow down 26 points, spent much of the session higher, dropping today by one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ down 25, that was a drop of three-tenths of one percent. Tenure down 18.30 seconds with a yield of 0.72%. Gold down five-tenths of one percent, 16.52 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate Crude down 7.8%, 24.06 a barrel. Recapping, turned out to be a losing Tuesday with the S&P down for a drop of two tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that update. Well, Susan Lyons' professional background, it has been in all worlds of media, publishing, multimedia. Also, she has become a venture capitalist and has been for several years. She's former president of ABC Entertainment. She ran Martha Stewart Omnimedia, oversaw AOL.com, directed the board of Gilt Group. So, um, so delighted to have her back with us. She's the founder and president of BBG Ventures, uh, making investments in women-founded startups, quite a portfolio. And she joins us on this Tuesday on the phone in New York. Susan, it is great to have you back with us. Really appreciate your time. I hope you, your family, uh, folks are doing okay. Everyone's fine. I've got children in Brooklyn. I've got uh, sisters here in Manhattan, and uh, and I'm here in Manhattan too. So uh, we're all working from home at this point, like yeah. the rest of the world. Right. We, yeah. Exactly. I I do wonder when you look at this, um, the kind of the world that we're in right now. You know, we talk about. People are doing more streaming. We're talking about changes that might come to education or medicine. I'm just curious, you know, with your investor hat on, you know, how you see it, how our world might be changing as a result of this. You know, this is the giant question out there. Um, I, I think we know the near-term impacts, I think, uh, and I'm happy to talk about some of the things we're seeing. I think the the more interesting piece of this is whether it will create um, behavior changes mm. over time. Uh, how much of what we are are being forced to do now will actually become part of our work lives or, as you say, learning lives or, um, or just the way we live. Um, and that I think will take time to really understand, but there are certain things that that I have to believe will never completely go back. You know, I I can't imagine that companies are going to go back to spending as much on business travel, for yeah. example, because everyone has been forced to figure out how to do business uh, across country uh, using Zoom or whatever uh, whatever video product your company. Uh, uses um, and there's a ton you can get done there's no question and it, it can be very intimate in fact so uh, things like that uh, I think are going to have um, a much bigger impact than just keeping us in for a couple of months and, and what do you let, let's continue talking about that because th- this is the most yeah. fascinating piece yeah, of this to, to me honestly Susan and, and Carol and I talk about it on air off air all the time we talk mm-hmm. about it within our company because we are seeing things differently uh, you know working from home candidly spending more time with our families in many cases yeah. I, I hope yeah. you know more balanced uh, parenting in, in some ways I'm not so what, tired not anymore <laughs> so what's the net effect of that do you think I think that, look, I hope it's going to have um, a, a lasting impact on things like co-parenting. That would be a beautiful thing. Um, and certainly, I think there's a lot of men out there who are realizing um, there's great pleasure in doing a lot more with their their families than maybe they were able to do uh, when they were working 16 hours a day. Um 
I do think that there will be more working from home. Just no question about it. There's a uh, there's value in it for companies. Uh, Maybe not full time, and certainly not for your entire team, as we're forced to do right now. But there's a lot of jobs that can be done remotely, and there are a lot of days in the week. I think when you could uh, organize things to do your work from a home office. So I do think that is going to have um, uh, run over effect. Um, and I think there's going to be demands on both sides of the table for it. I, I think there are, are companies who's, uh, who are going to realize they can be more efficient by doing this. And I think there are people in uh, all levels of jobs who are going to say, you know what, I, I want to work from home two days a week. Well, listen, like I think even, you know, TV, television, radio. Who would have thought? I mean, Jason and I are both, you know, we're a state apart. We're 40 miles apart. And we're right. doing, yep. you know, a co anchored show. And television, we've all seen people from their homes. Who would have thought that we would be able to do? I'm not saying that this, you know, we're the most important industry, hardly, but it would have been one of those things you're like, no, you can't do that from home. Well, yeah, we can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's. Um uh, someone said to me the other day that that they've seen the inside of people's uh, homes and apartments so <laughs> much more frequently in the last three weeks than they ever had in their lifetime. So there's there's definitely things you learn about your coworkers too when uh, when you are operating like this. Yeah, Jason has learned that I'm messy with books at the office, and my background is just a bunch of bookshelves, and he's learned that I'm messy or two with those. And Uh, Carol has learned that when I'm broadcasting from home, I broadcast from my daughter's bedroom, and so she can see, through our video con system, she can see all my two-year-old's bows and tutus hanging behind me, so that's okay. That's good. All right, Susan Line is going to stick with us. We're so excited to, to talk with her about what happens next. Also, given her background, we want to talk to her a little bit about what's going on in the media world as well. We're all consuming, uh, I think, probably more media and in different ways. And we're at such an interesting inflection point, uh, Carol, when it comes to that business. We know that to be true. And and you outlined so well uh, her background. So eager to talk with her about that as well. And I want to ask about her portfolio companies. She invests in food, technology, um, ride sharing, a lot of different companies. So I'm curious how And each one has to have a female founder. And everyone, which I love about it. Um, But we want to hear how they're doing as well. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser, Jason Kelly will come back with Susan Line in just a moment. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. Investors lost their optimism about coronavirus spread after seeing the number of deaths in New York and London spike. The averages fell a tenth to a third of a percent. The Dow and Nasdaq both falling 26 points, the S&P 4. Oil is also a reason investors pulled back from big gains. Crude futures ended the session lower. Investors started worrying the world's biggest oil producers will not be able to cut output enough. One delegate says among OPEC's options at its meeting, not cutting production at all. Crude oil prices fell nearly $2.50 to settle at twenty three sixty three dollars a barrel. The number of furloughed retail workers passed a million now with word the owner of TJ Maxx and Marshalls will furlough most of its store and distribution workers. They'll be paid through Saturday. Some of those furloughs are meeting the law of unintended consequences. Dow Jones says several companies have cited beefed up federal unemployment benefits as a reason for triggering furloughs. Joan Doniger, Bloomberg Radio. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Are you interested in a challenging and exciting career? One where you can be part of solving complex challenges across industries and geographies. Bloomberg's ever-expanding technology, data, news, and media services foster innovation.
offer nearly limitless opportunities for career growth. Visit Bloomberg.com slash careers today to view our current job opportunities. Bloomberg LP is an equal opportunity employer. The address once again is Bloomberg.com slash careers. This is a message from the government. Coronavirus is a national emergency. Life-threatening for people of all ages everywhere in the UK. To help save lives, you must stay home. Only go outside for food, health reasons, daily exercise or to work. But only if you cannot work from home. Stay home. Anyone can get it and anyone can spread it. Stay home to help protect the NHS and frontline staff working to save lives. Coronavirus. Stay home. Protect the NHS. Save lives. Get your MLB fix with these great podcasts on TuneIn. Fill your seventh inning stretch with the Ringer MLB show. It's a, it's a, I just can't get over it. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, Jeter Downs. Didn't realize he was a top. Like, my dad is drinking the Kool-Aid on this. He's like, oh, of course. you know, Mookie was going to leave. I'm like... What do you mean? You don't know that. Slide into second with the Starting Nine podcast. Nolan Arenado slides right into the top spot wow. for a favorite baseball player active in the league right now. It is a pleasure to be sitting next to you, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. this is uh, that we've been waiting a long time for. This. We actually, in terms of like Four active players, the bases with the Statcast podcast, uh, ways of going about it. You know, I picked third, so it, in some ways it made it easier to me for me. You know, Mike. Uh, just to go over the first couple of picks, you know, Mike took Barry Bonds, who I think was kind of the obvious guy to take number one. Not only was catch these and more MLB podcasts right here on TuneIn. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app and see the latest editions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. While you're at home, do you know about all the ways you can listen to TuneIn? From Sonos, Bose, and Roku to Alexa and Google Home, listen to audio your way using hundreds of compatible devices. Go to TuneIn.com to discover all the ways you can listen. Are we at war with COVID-19? The metaphor of choice is framing the way we confront the crisis and not in a good way. This virus does not have intent. It can't be negotiated with. There will be no truce. Also, in this time of national unity, should celebrities just shut up? Don't miss this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. April 7th, 2019, retiring NBA legends Dirk Nowitzki and Dwayne Wade play their final home games, both resulting in victories. And now, your greatest member, Dirk Certainly want to win it for Wade here at home in his final game in this building. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. Get your daily dose of NFL shop talk with these great podcasts on TuneIn. Start your morning off right with Around the NFL. Injured, depleted roster into the playoffs, and I didn't think they belonged in the playoffs. I think overall, though, it was, it was a great divisional round weekend because you got the first one. Run into the end zone with the Move the Sticks podcast. We had a fun little um, Zoom cocktail hour last night. Oh, yeah. What a star-studded affair. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, you were there for the earlier part, but it really popped off um, a little later on. We had Zach Goldman. And Rob. dive deep into the sidelines with the Peter King Podcast. On the occasion of his 50th birthday, come down and record a little bit of retrospective on the life and times of Brett Lorenzo Favre. That sounds like a bestseller. It's, no, it sounds like a precursor to a funeral. That's what it is. Uh, I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> Explore these and more hard-hitting NFL podcasts right here on TuneIn. Broadcasting live to New York, Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 99.1. To Boston, Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco, Bloomberg 960. To the country, Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business app and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. All right, coming up, we're going to continue our conversation with Susan Line. So much to talk to her about. So let's get back to Charlie Pellet with an update on the headlines. Hey, Charlie. Well, hello there. Speaking of headlines, developing 
developing story out of San Francisco. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey says he's moving a billion dollars of his equity in Square Inc. to start small LLC for global COVID-19 relief. Again, a billion dollars in equity in Square Inc. Dorsey says the focus for his charitable fund will be to shift to girls' health and education and universal basic income after, quote, we disarm this pandemic. Stocks close lower in volatile trading as investors debated whether the spread of the coronavirus may be slowing in several major economies. Oil sank, bonds retreated, the tenure down 20, 30 seconds, yield 0.72%. Crude, West Texas Intermediate dropping another 7.2%, back at 24.18 a barrel. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ, all spent most of the day higher, a lot higher. S&P down four, a drop there of two-tenths of one percent, have been up as much as three and a half percent. The Dow down 26, down one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ down 26, a drop of three-tenths of one percent. Gold down six-tenths of one percent, 16.51 the ounce. Again, crude oil moved lower. Now, what about the uh, stimulus, more stimulus out of Washington? Julia Coronado is president of Macro Policy Perspectives. Well, we clearly need an expansion of the small business lending capacity. It looks like they're going to need at least twice what they legislated. So they legislated 350. We need at least seven to eight hundred billion, probably, to satisfy demand. And again, recapping, S&P down four, down two-tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellop. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, got it, Charlie. Thank you so much. Still with us is Susan Line. She is founder and managing partner of BBG Ventures, and she joins us uh, on the phone from New York. So, Susan, I was curious about your portfolio companies. You have investments in a lot of different types of companies, beauty companies, consumer products, hospitality, food, technology. Um, I think we're having a little tech- technical problem, but uh, we'll try and get back to Susan Line so we can continue our conversation. But I do love, Jason, you and I have had conversations with venture capitalist investors who do invest in an array of companies, and we get a feeling of how things are going, because these are the smaller businesses that are the backbone of our economy and that will continue to be going forward if they can get through. Well, and the other th- other thing to, to keep in mind is while this is a very difficult time to run a company and you're thinking about cash flow and I think about a lot of the entrepreneurs and say the fitness industry and retail and restaurants and things like that these are also the times when new businesses are started where people look around the corner a little bit they start to think about all the questions we were talking with Susan Line about just a few minutes ago about right. how will life be different how will what will people want to do how will they consume media differently where will they shop how will they shop what are they going to do what are they going exactly how behavior is going to change because i think we know this to be true we will get back to something resembling normal life but we don't know exactly uh what that's going to look like so susan line uh back with us uh susan thanks for hanging on uh gotta ask you you know Given all of your experience in the media world, what do you make of the media world right now? We're at such an interesting inflection point, and we're testing all these different things, given everybody's streaming and consuming in a different way. What do you see out there? Yeah, look, I think this is a, a really interesting moment, um, certainly for, as you said, streaming media. I think it's obviously much tougher for for scripted media, for entertainment. Um, there's tons of it being consumed right now, but until and unless they can get back to actually producing, um, it's going to be far more difficult. But there's no question moments like this uh, make people hungry to understand what's going on in the world and hungry to you know, be entertained, to laugh, and there are so many options for for viewing at this moment. I think the mainstream media, well, you can see just by the ratings numbers, um, they've doubled uh, their audience in some cases even more than that for what we consider mainstream media, things like cable news. Um, and I think that will continue for a while, but I think the issue is how do you uh, keep that kind of, um, I would say, solution to what people need, what people want on a daily basis once they're not completely isolated and, uh, and once they're, um, they're no longer concerned about the immediate health threat? 
Yeah, exactly. Like I, I we, we will see how much of this, you know, ultimately stays with us. I mean, I'm one of those people who's, you know, I've been binged on oh, Tiger yeah. King, but I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, yeah. I do wonder, we're going to be talking with Meg Whitman of Quibi, CEO of Quibi. They yep. launched just yesterday. When you look at the media world, what are the types of investments that you find interesting? Well, I think Quibi is really interesting. We tend to invest uh, less in what I would call traditional media, largely because um, it's been a challenging sector uh, because it's hard to figure out how to monetize it. So our focus has been much more on um, on technology investments, on uh, commerce investments, on on services, um, things that uh, we know our core customers are looking for. Um, really, when when you when you dig into what female entrepreneurs are building, they're problem solvers. They're consumer problem solvers. So uh, they look at some aspect of life and think, you know, either this is missing or I can create a much better experience. Um, and I know it's so a, it, it's like making you pick among your children, but you only have about a, mi- a minute left here, Susan. What's one thing in your portfolio that you would point to that's representative of that? Well, I'll tell you about two because they're sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. One is the wing, which has been... Mm-hmm deeply impacted by by COVID, but they are well capitalized and they they will be reborn once this is over uh, because it it created um, a very safe place for women and a joyful place for women. And I think that um, the the need for a place to work, to learn, to to come together, to meet your next partner, right. to whatever, right. is still going to be there. Susan, I just um, got 20 seconds left. Forgive me. Okay. The your other one company. is Squad. So mm-hmm. this is a screen sharing app that allows you to hang out with your friends. Think Zoom for yeah. friends and family. Um, and they have just taken off. So, you know, two very Good different timing. companies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, interesting. All right, we can't wait to catch up with you again. We really appreciate it. Susan Line, founder and managing partner of BBG Ventures. Carol? Thank you so much. Stay safe, Susan. Really appreciate it. All right, folks, we do want to get back to World of National News headlines for that. It's over to Ed Baxter in San Francisco. All right, Carol, thank you. A day of mixed news and major hotspots today regarding the coronavirus. In New York, for example, a worse day for deaths during the pandemic. But the appearance of the case of the curve is flattening because of the separation policies. This virus is very good at what it does, and it kills vulnerable people. That's what it does. And it does that very well. And we can't stop that. The question is, are you saving everyone you can save? Governor Andrew Cuomo saying the key is testing to get people back to work and to life. The same is happening in New Jersey. Governor Phil Murphy. We cannot be happy with only reaching a plateau. We need to keep strong and keep determined to see that curve begin to fall and ultimately get to zero. In California, Governor Gavin Newsom. ICUs went up to 1,108. That was about a 2.1% increase uh, over uh, the course of the last 24 hours. Uh, 2.1% will take. Now he calls it a bending of the curve, but does say the curve could be extended. What-